I shall start. Okay, so um, we're going to speak to you uh, today a, a little bit more, uh, well, a bit of a radical departure, I think. Oh, heck, go ahead. Oh, <laughs> very radical, way too radical. You don't want to hear about teaching. Uh, this has been very research focused, um, uh, which is wonderful. And there's, there's some incredible research and uh, ideas and thought being generated about um, about climate archaeology. Um, and we just wanted to take it off in a little bit of a different tack and talk about not just research in climate archaeology, but how we then go on to teach that um, as, um, as educators, largely uh, within um, the higher education sector, within largely within the UK. But this has also been brought, um, we bring to you um, remotely Marcel Brockmiller, uh, who's based at the University of Rostock, um, and uh, Karina and is here in the audience, um, and also Hannah Cobb, who unfortunately can't be with us today. Um, and um, Monica, who's from the University of Glasgow, uh, and Catherine Patton, who's from the University of Toronto. So we're bringing, a, hopefully, a sort of a, a global, if not Western, perspective to you. Um, so what we want to, 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 to talk about is, um, as I said, uh, climate archaeology has received and generated um, a lot um, of, of impacts and, and research uh, than we recognise um, now, uh, if not before, um, how much... Uh, archaeology has played a part in, in and contributed to understanding uh, climate change. And also, we think about how climate change is going to affect archaeology. Uh, that's a, a very, very uh, strong theme that's coming through um, uh, the, the, the literature now. Um, and we, we know that archaeology has a major role to, to play in sustainable development and conservation, uh, and that there is these links between policymakers uh, and other stakeholders as well. But what does this mean uh, in terms of teaching? Uh, and I just kind of wanted to draw your attention to this uh, fantastic um, diagram in um, Ariana Burke's uh, and colleagues' uh, paper uh, on the workflow of archaeology of climate change and how this all feeds into it together. But I think um, I do feel that teaching is kind of missing from that diagram. And I just um, sneakily uh, slotted in this slide uh, just before we started um, to, to just demonstrate how much um, the recognition of, of, of climate archaeology is, is coming to the fore and how many um, national and organizations and institutions have issued statements on climate change in archaeology. Um, and within these, they recognize uh, that the way we teach uh, archaeology needs to change. But how? What should we teach instead? How do we go about teaching it? Do we move away from the culture, history and discipline specific mm -hmm. thinkings and questions to the wider relevance, for example, and to problem solving? How do we do this? Um, and how do we then scale it for a variety of teaching settings as well? Is it purely classroom, classroom based? Do we start to move away and break down those um, boundaries within pedagogy as well? For myself, I have um, just very uh, unsystematically and uh, ad hoc uh, anecdotally talked to the students that I teach as part of the Mesolithic Archaeology Master's Programme at the University of York and also with my undergraduate students as well uh, about the Mesolithic. That's my period specialism. Uh, and I want to know from them whether or not they think as non-archaeologists, as students who are training in in archaeology who are perhaps learning about prehistory and quite often the Mesolithic uh, for the first time, what can we learn from hunter-gatherer responses to climate change? Um, and quite often they just come back to me and say, well, they just moved out of the way, which ties into a lot of uh, presumptions and assumptions about what hunter-gatherers do and are, and, and that there was just this no man's land away from the edge of the coast that they could have just moved into. Um, and and Partly this is to do with perception and, and a, a lack of teaching at, at, of younger students and, and at school level, although um, within the UK, uh, Stone Age is now incorporated into uh, Key Stage 2 primary school curriculum. But we see that there are problems um, because it's not relatable, at least largely within a, a UK-based worldview, at least within their own worldview. The contemporary populations, we can't do this, we can't just up our cities and move. Um, and I think this, um, in, in speaking with other schools, uh, and particularly uh, schools with a, an intake of traveler communities, is that this highlights bigger issues of underrepresentation of diverse uh, lifeways and cultures uh, within archeology span and, and more broadly, I think. Uh, and also weaving narratives um, potentially could be a way of humanizing the experience. Uh, and we, we narrative theory um, and uh, the late Don Henson 
worked so hard uh, for this, and we shall be uh, raising a drink to him tonight, uh, about whether or not narrative theory can really help humanise this, or whether it uh, is it educational, or does it just lead to escapism, essentially? Uh, and, and we can escape from these big, scary things that are happening in the world today um, by retreating into the past through our rose-tinted glasses. Um, and also time. Within the neoliberal systems with it that we work in within the UK, how can we effectively condense 6,000 years of the Mesolithic into 60 minutes of a lecture um, is something that I'm definitely wrangling with. Um, and, I mean, I've just been covering Paleolithic teaching as well, and it's even worse. Um, and my colleague Marcel has, uh, has seen uh, tangentially this same thing in, in, with his work in, in Germany. Um, and that his research uh, looking at prehistoric and, uh, and hunter-gatherer lifestyles and, and how this has, has shaped our, our bodies, our ways of complex thinking, the way that we feel and we act within groups, our sociality as, as a species, essentially, with, with some direct implications for today. But then in talking to students about it, they have little to no idea about, um, as I've also encountered, the time depth of these big environmental dynamics. And we've spoken a lot today. We've seen a lot of presentations that have, have talked about these big scalar things, this, this, this movement of climate and how it's just imperceptible uh, within a human lifetime. So these glacial, interglacial, sea level changes example. Um, and, and therefore, they also do not have then that perception and awareness um, about the, the depth of, of human adaptation and and sometimes it's successful and sometimes it's not. And very, uh, I think a, a failure of our species is perhaps not to talk about the failure of our species. So then uh, through teaching, students then begin to learn basic knowledge about environmental change. But can we do this within archaeology? Is it the remit of that? It's not just part of our discipline. We also talk about things and objects and, and theory um, and related coping strat strategies. Um, and by doing so, we can equip them to enter the discussion uh, regarding resilience, uh, sustainability and vulnerability by using non-complex scenarios. So just engaging on a very basic level with them. Um, and he's found through uh, through teaching them is basically, there's a, an amazement that we even managed. We were even alive uh, today because of all the complexities that were faced, which I think is um, you know, testament to, to an excellent teaching strategy, um, but also highlights uh, some, yes, some of those fundamental challenges that I touched upon in the previous slide. Um, so, to, and, and that quote, to, to know that the humans have successfully coped many kinds of uh, climate changes makes me a little bit more relaxed concerning the actual climate crisis. So this is hopefully um, also by, by engaging with this deep time and the, the, the fact that people have, have managed to come through this before, if not necessarily uh, within the Anthropocene and, and, and a humanly accelerated uh, means of it, is that it's it's helping to allay some of that doomism that I think that, that is almost uh, paralytic in, in terms of active activism. Um, and this uh, slide hopefully will be, um, if I click on it, I hope it works. No, it's not going to work. Um, is going to be a case study of Catherine's um, from North America. There are several factors that need to be integrated into teaching about archaeology and climate change in Canada and other subsequent nations. A central facet is teaching students, many of whom may be non Indigenous, about Indigenous sovereignty over heritage and lands. Canada, for example, has the longest coastline in the world, and so erosion due to rising sea levels and storm surges associated with increasing hurricane, storm activity, etc., is doing enormous damage to archaeological sites and heritage, a disproportionate amount of which is indigenous and typically on unceded lands. Central to any movement forward, then, is indigenous decision making around our resources. While there is an uneasy relationship between and many indigenous communities. Uh, several nations rely on indigenous nations rely on archaeological evidence to demonstrate land use, which is essential in land claims and treaty. What should archaeology's purpose be in light of the fact that indigenous heritage is eroding? <laughs> it did, it stopped. No, it's okay, it's somewhere along there. Canadian Archaeological Association, for example, has called for a shift in approach towards stewardship, to stewardship uh, and by that I mean a stewardship in conjunction with Indigenous communities, or rather Indigenous-led uh, stewardship which archaeologists would support. 
uh, and knowledge over research, uh, over research questions, more conventional research questions. How do we square the fact that much more heritage is lost to development, however, and much of this development is uh, includes natural resource extraction, which continues to exacerbate carbon output and by extension climate change? Teaching about archaeology and climate change in Canada means helping students to understand the history of South Africa. Uh, uh, oh, no. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Oh my god. It's about, uh, if you hover over that, and then we're about, yeah, two minutes. Climate change in Canada means helping students to understand the history of South Africa. Uh, and this can be a complicated uh, thing to do. These are very complex ideas, and students sometimes report that knowing this history and coming to understand the climate crisis can feel overwhelming. And so we need to find a way to teach these ideas, this history, in a way uh, that fosters hope for change, uh, and change particularly in archaeology's priorities, goals, and practice. We managed it. <laughs> um,